Well, welcome to another episode of Real Estate Investing with Jay Connor. I'm Jay Connor, you're the Private Money Authority, and I'm the host of the show here. And I want to extend a very, very special welcome to you. If this particularly is your first show, we talk about all things real estate investing. Uh, I'm known as the Private Money Authority. Up until about ten and a half years ago, I was relying on the local banks and mortgage companies and hard money lenders to provide the funding for my deals. But when I was cut off, I was introduced to this wonderful world of private money and haven't missed out on a deal since. I'm not talking hard money. I'm talking about doing business with individuals. And so I've got a free gift for all of my uh, viewers and listeners. And that is if you want to learn how to get all the funding for your deals and never miss out on a deal, then I've got a, a free online class waiting for you to attend. It's at www dot j connor j a y c o n n e r dot com forward slash money podcast that website again is j connor j a y c o n n e r dot com forward slash money podcast i will teach you the five steps of how to go from having no funding for your deals to unlimited funding over the past year plus since we launched the show we're quickly approaching over two hundred thousand downloads and listens and it's all because of you. If you've been listening to us on iTunes, be sure and uh, subscribe, uh, rate and review uh, so you don't miss out on any of our future shows. But if you've been tuning in, you know I've had some amazing guests and experts on the show. That's what makes the show so unique and important and valuable to you. And today is no different. I'm so excited to have as my friend and business colleague, John Martinez here on the show with me. He's a serial entrepreneur. And he is also a highly sought after sales expert. And you're going to for sure get a big dose of that here in just a second. John, besides being a friend of mine, he's also best known for his sales training, particularly in the real estate investment industry. So if you are a seasoned real estate investor or you haven't even done your first real estate deal yet, you definitely want to pay close attention to John because he's going to show you here in the next few minutes how you can really ramp up your business as we dive into his topic that he's an expert on. And so for example, John has already trained over 500 of the country's top real estate investors and their teams. He teaches and coaches on scripts and sales and negotiation strategies. And quite frankly, the clients that he's worked with, he's been a part of transforming the entire real estate investing industry. And John is also now widely accepted as the real estate investing industry's gold standard for sure. John, welcome to the show. Hey, great to be here. Thanks for having now, me. I'm looking forward to seeing you in the next few days, John, at our uh, next mastermind meeting that we're in together. Absolutely. Looking forward to it as well. Me too. Me too. It's always great to get together with like-minded people and um, help each other with our businesses and, and et cetera. So John, I've been very interested in having you come here on the show, carved out a particular niche on working with real estate investors, working with their teams in this area of, of sales. But before we get into your expert, tell us a little bit more about your background. How long have you been a real estate investor and how did you get into it? You know, actually I, I don't invest in any real estate myself today. I've, I've bought hundreds of houses. I'll tell you how without being a real estate investor, but I've been in sales, some form of sales for about 20 years now, climbing the corporate ladder, you know, leadership roles, director of sales, director of sales and marketing. And about six or so years ago, launched my own sales training company because that was my favorite part of, of building sales teams, basically. And about five years ago, we got pulled into a real estate, the real estate investment world. And it really just took over our business. So we ended up shutting down all other industries that we, we trained in and just focused on real estate investment. So that brings me how I, to how I actually bought houses. So when we were kind of adapting our training to this specific industry, I wanted to get to know it a lot better. So I spent uh, probably about a year on the road. Uh, as we trained, I went market to market across the country and I'd hop in the car with investors, acquisition agents, and I'd go buy houses and I would train them. You know, today all of our trainings online are at boot camps, but back then I would train one-on-one -on -one and we would just, uh, we just go buy houses together. I'd buy some, they'd buy some, I'd coach them. So over the course of a year, I bought houses coast to coast, even set up shop in my local market to spend about three months uh, buying houses here to, to really just get the training dialed into this specific industry. 
I got you. So when we talk about the importance of being really, really good in sales in this world of real estate investing, are you talking, so what area do we need to, in your opinion, become really, really good salespeople and negotiators? Is it, I would think you just mentioned it on the buying side. So you're talking about when you're negotiating with a seller of a property, right? Right. I mean, that's the most obvious place. I mean, you, you got to be good in all aspects of sales, whether it's on the acquisitions or the dispositions or shoot, even, you know, working with your contractors or other vendors and, and, and things of that nature. So you need to be good across the board. We really focus on the acquisition side though, because what we've realized is regardless of, of exit, or even if you are exiting, if you're just buy and hold, you got to buy the property at the right price and the better deal you get on the house, kind of the more mistakes you can make too and, and be forgiven for. So we focus on the buy side of things because it just, it, it, imp it impacts everything. I got you. So can anybody be good in sales? Can anybody really learn the negotiation techniques of, uh, that would actually take them to buying more houses? Yeah, I mean, and it's, you know, we traditionally look at sales as kind of like this art, and to an extent it is, but a lot of people look at sales as, hey, this is a natural salesperson, this is not, and there's a little bit of, there's some truth to that. Some people are just better suited for sales, just the, the way they're built, but sales is a process like any other piece of any other business, you know, whether it's accounting or whether it's you know, on the construction side, whatever it is, we all put these processes in place. And we know, hey, if I follow this step-by-step -step process, I can kind of predict what kind of outcome I'm going to get. Sales is the same. If you are able to teach that process uh, in such a way that anyone can follow that process, they can get good results with sales. Uh, again, some people might be, you know, a little better suited for it personality-wise. And I think we have the most success with our company because we have focused on not just training, quote-unquote, salespeople but anyone in the sales role. So yeah, I think anyone can sell. You know, for years, I thought the best sales people and the best, well, not as a negotiator, but the best sales people to close the deal were those that, you know, had the outgoing personality, you know, was the glad handler, was the person that made you feel good, um, you know, very outgoing. But as I have observed very, very successful salespeople in different teams and different organizations. What amazed me as I really started observing personalities, sometimes it's the person that's like really quiet, doesn't say that much. I mean, you wouldn't know they were in the room, but when they sat down with a one-on-one -on -one appointment with someone to discuss how they could be a coach or how they could help them in their business, it's like, they were, I've seen them close more deals and have higher conversion rates, being a very soft personality with persistent questions with the right questions and close more deals. What's been your observations? Yeah, you're exactly right. And there, there's plenty of data to actually back that up. Uh, introverts usually make better salespeople and there's a number of reasons for it. Number one, you know, when you look at that outgoing individual, let's think about what makes them outgoing is, is, they're talking a lot is, is one thing, right? They're, they're talking, sharing, conversing, and they want to make the other person feel really comfortable. And that's why they're so likable. But now let's look at sales. If you're the one always talking, that's not a good sign, right? Great salespeople ask questions and, and do very little of the talking. They let their, their prospects or home sellers kind of self-discover why they should do business with you and, and kind of convince themselves. Uh, and they just guide that conversation through questions. So that takes the outgoing person and uh, makes them, you know, not usually the best, best salesperson. The other piece of that is outgoing people want to be liked. And that's why they've developed those characteristics. That's why they are so good at being liked. But in sales, it's more important to be respected. And if you are trying to be liked, let's talk about the things you won't do. You won't ask the uncomfortable questions, which sometimes it's necessary to ask. You won't take the conversation to some places you need it to go because you might make the, the seller or prospect a little bit uncomfortable. And when it comes to negotiating, you're going to want to give them what they want to keep that relationship good and to keep them happy. So when we actually look at the top salespeople across the country in any industry, 
we find that under 5% of top performing salespeople are actually those, those outgoing extroverted type, type of people. So that's a very small percentage of, of top performers nationwide. Right. So if someone is the owner of their real estate investing business and they have this very, very outgoing personality and strive to be liked, you recommend they get an acquisitionist with this other type personality as soon as they can? Well, you know, uh, a great question. You just want to make sure that those hidden weaknesses that keep them from selling effectively are addressed. So usually the easiest way to do that is by implementing a step-by-step -step sales process and holding that salesperson accountable to that process, making sure the right questions are asked, making sure they go deep enough in certain parts of the conversation, uncover the information they need to. And then if you train them to stick to those, hey, you have to ask these questions, we need to find out this information, we need to accomplish these things on a sales call, then it can actually work out really well when you mesh those two things. So the secret really is making, whether it's an introvert or extrovert, making sure they stick to, stick to the script, stick to a sales process. Because sometimes when you marry those two things up, the right sales process and someone who's just easily likable, you, you can find a, a really good salesperson if you get those two things together. So, you know, you've worked with some real estate investing organizations and teams here in the nation that do, you know, over a hundred deals a year, right? You've worked with people that are wholesalers, flippers, et cetera. I mean, regardless of what our exit strategy is, we still got to find the deal. We still got to negotiate the deal. We've still got to talk with, you know, and negotiate the deal with the seller. So my next question, John, is given all these different organizations and, and people that you've worked with, real estate investors, what are some common, what are some commonalities that you've noticed of some of the biggest mistakes that real estate investors have made in the past that you've been able to observe and put them on a better track and increase their closing ratios? Right. There's a handful of them. So I'll kind of try to pick through them quickly uh, and some are going to kind of blend together. So I would say when it comes to building a sales team, the biggest, probably two biggest mistakes I see is hiring too few people. Most investors start with one acquisition agent. And what typically happens is this, if they're, if they're not really vetting them out in the beginning, they just kind of go and by their gut. For example, hey, this person's really outgoing. They might be a great salesperson. They, they, they hire one instead of two or three, even though they might eventually only need one. Here's why that's a mistake. When you hire one person, I've seen this so many times and it, it hurts to watch. They hire one salesperson. They just, they put all of this energy and all of these resources into that salesperson to train them. And when that salesperson doesn't work out or isn't performing, the investor is very reluctant to let them go because they, they have so much invested in them, in them personally. So they hold on to them for way too long. And then what happens is now it's two, three, four months down the line. Finally, that relationship does end, but it only ends when it's absolutely necessary, which means there's been uh, you know, a few bad months or for whatever reason, it's just they can't go forward any longer. And then the investor is right back into the acquisition spot and starting over from scratch. So I can't tell you how many times I've seen that around the hiring, just not vetting enough on the front end and then just hiring one person instead of multiple people and then getting stuck in this hamster wheel where it's like this three or four month cycle of just, it, just pain, right? Uh, not working out and then being back in the driver's seat, back where they started after three or four months, tons of leads wasted, opportunities wasted, everyone feeling burnt out. So around hiring, that's probably the biggest mistake. It's just not, not taking your time, hiring the right person, and then going all in on that one person instead of hiring two or three, because uh, there's some creative ways you can do that, no matter how big your organization is. I'd say the other thing I've seen, you know, if we're talking about kind of the, the, the biggest mistakes that, that people tend to make is probably around letting salespeople run the show, write their own scripts, come with their own sales process. Instead of saying, hey, this is the sales process we use. This is our blueprint and I expect you to follow it. Because what happens then is, you know, as they're looking to scale or or even if they're not looking to scale, maybe they see turnover. If they don't have a blueprint, step-by-step -step sales process set up, it, it makes that incredibly difficult. Uh, let's say you hire a second person. Now, the second salesperson or third salesperson, they're all selling differently. It's really hard to have a sales meeting and say, 
hey, where are all these deals at? What are the next steps? What are we missing to get this thing to the finish line? Because everyone's doing their own thing. They don't speak the same language even. Uh, so that's difficult. Or if you see turnover and you have no process in place, it's incredibly hard to train that new person. You have to usually jump back in the driver's seat and do it all over again because there's no standard system or process in place. So I guess to sum all of that up, it's like everything else in building a real estate investing business. The best investors have systems and processes documented for everything. And I think the biggest mistake an investor can make is not treating sales the same way as any other part of their business. The question that comes to mind is, you know, after observing all these different organizations and real estate investors, what does a bad process look like? And I think I know the answer to that question. And that is, I would think a majority of real estate investors out there don't even have a process, right? They, they, don't, even ha they don't have a system. Or if yeah. they do, it's like sort of from the seat of our pants, so to speak. So maybe a better question for me to ask you is, what are some of the critical elements of a really good process? So, you know, first thing I would say is never lead with your offer. There's conversation, and I'll tell you what the pieces are to that conversation in just a minute, but never lead with, with your offer. Otherwise, you're basically just going to property to property and saying, here's my offer, take it or leave it. Now, that works if you're in a market where there's unlimited opportunities and you've got leads flying in the door that are dirt cheap and you can just sprinkle you know, offers out there everywhere and, and plenty of people are just saying yes and grabbing it. But most investors don't have a market where leads are getting more and more expensive. Uh, competition is getting more and more fierce. And it's more and more important as things tighten up to get the best deal possible. So if you're in one of those markets where you, you, you want to make the most out of everything, there's a couple things you want to do before you get to the offer. Once you give an offer, and I'll, why this is, is once you give an offer, you lose all leverage. So, you know, when a real estate investor is talking to a home seller, the only reason that conversation is even occurring is because the two parties want something from each other. The homeowner wants to know what, you know, what an offer would look like. And the real estate investor wants the chance to explain what they do and, and make that offer. So if you make that offer too early, they have everything they need from you and the conversation stops. And there's some other critical pieces of conversation you want to have. So that's why you hold your offer back, number one, one of the reasons. The two probably most critical pieces of conversation you want to have on the front side are about motivation. And when we talk about motivation, I'm talking about going deep into to motivation. When I talk about motivation, it's not checking boxes, you know, are they financially distressed, tired landlord? It's finding out how this property is, is impacting them on a personal level. When people make a decision to sell, especially to an investor at discount, it's always for personal reasons. So example, financial distress. People don't sell because of financial distress. They, they sell because of the other people around them that might be affecting. It, they sell because of the relationships that are, are being impacted by this property, by the emotional distress, by things that they're not able to do, uh, opportunities they're not able to take advantage of. Those are the reasons why people sell. And when we talk about just the, the psychology of selling, the deeper you get into that personal impact, you help your prospects self-discover why it's important to take action, and that increases the motivation to take that action. So having that conversation, you know, what's your motivation? And let's talk about that. Like, let's really talk about that. Why is it important to take care of that now? That's going to turn tire kickers into motivated sellers and motivated sellers into people who uh, have an increased urgency to just, just take action and take care of their problem now. So from a sales perspective, and I won't nerd out on you here, I have, I have a tendency to do that, but that's why that's so important. And when we talk about how decisions are made from a neuroscience perspective, Decision, complex decisions are made in the emotional parts of the brain. Again, I'm not going to go crazy and, and get weird on you, but complex decisions are made from the emotional part of the brain. So you, we've got to take the conversation there to actually get a prospect primed for a decision. Now, the other critical piece of conversation is once motivation's high and people are in a state where they're, hey, you know what? I'm ready to take action. It's something I need to take care of we need to systematically uncover everything that's going to keep them from taking action. Cause we've all talked to a ton of motivated sellers who really want to sell, but for some reason don't take action. It means something's in the way. So then you want to take the conversation to, you know, are there other, any, any influencers who is going to, who are going to, you know, 
sway the deal one way or the other? Are there risks, uh, sources of discomfort that can stop the deal from going forward? Is there a fear of leaving money on the table if they move forward? So then you want to systematically work through the deal killers. So our sales process is basically we go deep into motivation, get the, the, the seller, you know, in touch with why they really want to sell. We don't introduce anything or manipulate. We just, we get, we help them get very clear on the decision and why it's important to them. Once they're motivated and ready to take action, we just want to remove any roadblocks that are going to be in the way of them from taking action. Then is when we get to our offer and, you know, actually, you know, make an offer on the property. Speaking of offers, do you train and teach real estate investors or acquisitionists to make multiple offers? And let me define what I mean by that before you answer, just to make sure our audience is on board with us. So let's say we're talking to the owner of a property that is motivated to sell for whatever t reason. And let's say, for example, it's free and clear. Let's say that there's, there's no underlying debt, uh, there's no mortgage owed, and it doesn't matter what the motivation is, but you're, you're talking to the decision maker. So an example, a, a multiple offer would be, well, I can either pay you X amount, which would be the highest amount offer, if they would consider selling on terms or selling with seller financing or owner financing and, you know, take monthly payments, I can offer more money for that. Or if they want all cash, I'm going to offer a substantially less amount, but I'd be offering them all cash. What's your thoughts and opinions on giving a sellers multiple offers? So I think it's a, it's a great strategy but you have to be an extremely disciplined investor or salesperson to use that strategy. And I'll just outline some of the dangers of using it if, if you're not extremely disciplined with, with the process you follow. So one of the things that keep deals from happening are just, hey, if you, you have to think it over, there's, there's indecision because there's a lot of options on the table. So you don't wanna give so many options that it turns into, let me think about this, sort things through and get back to you because we might be, be leaving a deal on the table that we otherwise could have picked up. Right. So I think a lot of investors that use that strategy will, will really try to figure out which option they're going to go with or, or offer through the initial conversation and pitch one. Now, sometimes I'll pitch one or two or three, but the, when I've seen it used most effectively, they usually try to figure out what they're going to recommend on the front end. Uh, it doesn't always work out that way, but then have one recommendation because you can increase conversion rates with one recommendation. The way you increase conversion rates is you remove some of the, the, the indecision, the questions about, should I go this way or that? And the other reason that will increase conversion rates is when you get to the end, you eliminate one of the most common, you know, put offs. Let me think about it. Let me think through things. And you can go straight to a, a you know, the line I usually use is, and I, I call it a line, but it's just what I usually say is, hey, listen, after everything we've talked about, you know, if you're not a hundred percent confident that this is, the way to go for you, then I, you know, I think we need to call it what it is. It's, it's probably just not a fit and perfectly okay. No hard feelings, but it, it, it probably means we don't need to move forward. So if you have multiple options, it doesn't let you do that. The reason why I recommend taking the deal off the table, if you, if you get stuck with a maybe or think it over at the end is because there's only three things that can happen with that ending. And all three things are great for investors and salespeople. Number one, it might be a no, and then they're comfortable telling you no, right? So many investors get, you know, let me think it over. Or let me go through those options, those types of answers, when really it's just a no and the people are just being nice, right? They don't want to talk to you. <laughs> you know what I heard years ago, John? I heard yes means yes, no means no, and maybe means no. <laughs> yeah, anything other than yes or no is no. So, so that's exactly it. So it eliminates some of that, that. And if it is going to be a no, like, let's figure it out on the front end. So we know what our next step is, you know, are we putting them in a nurturing campaign? Are we going to try a different type of offer? Are we, you know, what are we going to do instead of having, you know, investors with high lead flow, you, you accept maybes and think it over is you're only going to go 60 days before you've got 200 people in your follow-up queue and your system starts to fall apart because you can't keep up with it all. So if it is a no, and they tell you it's a no, that's a good position to be in because now you know what's going on and you can, you can deal, you can do whatever you're going to do with it. The second thing that might happen is sometimes people don't make decisions, especially big decisions like this, until they have to. So what we see lots of times is, you know, when you say, you know, anything other than a yes is a no, and that's, that's perfectly okay. They say, you know what, 
I got to do something about this. Let's just go ahead and knock it out. Right. So it just, it, it takes, it takes a time to, of them having to make the decision right now and they, they make the decision. And sometimes it, that's a deal. So now we've got two possible options there. It's a no when you find out or they say, you know what, I'm not letting this deal get away. Let's go ahead and do it. That's a yes. The third thing that might happen is there is some motivation, but there's one of those deal killers still holding them back. They haven't figured out something. They need to work through something. They're a little scared about something and that's when it pops out and then you could deal with it. So it typically sounds in my experience like, no, no, John, it, you know, I didn't say that. I'm still really trying to figure out what I'm going to do with this or where I'm going to go here or how I'm going to deal with my sister-in-law who wants to list the house. And then that is exposed and you can deal with it. So no matter what, all three of those things are good. A yes, a no, or a here's what's holding me back. So I love the multiple offers, but you have to be disciplined and just not let it work against you and give people too much of an out to just end up with endless amounts of maybes and think it over, if that makes sense. Yeah, that, that's a lot of great, brilliant advice. And no doubt you've learned that over the years <laughs> of work, working with so many of these real estate investors. So, you know, we've all heard that initial conversation that, you know, if you're a one man or one woman show real estate investor, or you've got an acquisitionist or acquisitionist working with you, regardless, whoever has, and whenever that first initial conversation the voices are heard for the first time, typically over the phone. And your answer to this question may depend on where they came from in the marketing. So, you know, we got different marketing, you know, you can have, you know, you have a Facebook ad that they saw, all right, to where, you know, you're offering to buy houses or they may have seen a bandit sign next to the road, or they may have Googled you and they typed in, you know, sell my house fast or buy my house fast. And now they're seeking after you. So I'll let you answer this question. If there's any, it depends on what marketing funnel that they came from. They might be responding to a direct mail postcard, but regardless or, or bearing in mind, not regardless, bearing in mind where they came from and how they learned about you. We've all heard that building rapport, right up front is so important, so important. And so what are some tips, strategies, advice you can give on what are the secrets to building rapport right away? Yeah, what do so you do? What do you do? What do you don't do? Great question. So what I recommend is we answer the questions they have on their mind immediately and let them know exactly what to expect. So we, you know, we, we've done a lot of training with lead managers and those types of people. And, and uh, I even operated a call center for a few years. Where we were making 100,000 out, outbound calls a day throughout the U.S. And as we ran scripts and tested and all this kind of stuff, three questions, two or three questions would pop up and leads or w w prospects would not move forward with the conversation or get comfortable until they had those questions answered. And those questions were always around, you know, what's going to happen? What can I expect? How long is this conversation going to take? Are you going to try to pressure me into something? Those types of questions. The, the, the conversations were always uncomfortable until they had those questions. So we start out every call, regardless of marketing avenue, by answering the questions that are on their mind. So it might sound like this. Hey, thanks for, uh, hey, thanks for calling in. My name's John with We Buy Houses Fast. Typically, people who call in want to know, you know, how we do what we do, how much we can offer for their house, and those types of questions. Do you have the same types of questions? Yes. Awesome. These calls usually just take a few minutes. I'll just have a few questions about your property so I can get you those answers. Be sure to answer any questions you have for me. And at that point, if it makes sense to take some type of next step, we'll figure out what that is and, and see if it makes sense to put that in place. So that opening right there is something like it. They know, okay, this is not going to be an hour long conversation, right? So they're not getting antsy, not saying, how many questions do you have? They know they're going to have, be able to ask questions and get them answered. They know you're going to ask them a few questions, so they're not going to be caught off guard and, and, hey, why do you need to know that and that type of thing. So we take the questions uh, to build rapport quickly over the phone. The questions that kind of are already on their mind, they're not going to be able to relax till we answer those. So we try to answer time frame, agenda, and next steps right up front. Those are the three things we hit. Brilliant, brilliant. Yeah, I'll share real quick what I do in my market. I don't recommend this. Well, I'll, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what I do in my market. 
So I'm going to get you to coach me in front of thousands and thousands of people right here on the podcast. How about that, John? Yeah. So what I do in my market, I don't know would work in a much larger market where there was a lot of competition. So I'm in a small market. My total market area is only 40,000 people. I'm one of the few consistent full-time real estate investors in my area. There's not many of us, and I'm the only one that I know of that, that does consistent marketing, Facebook, direct mail campaigns, et cetera. The reason I know that is because I have people watching Facebook and I own so many houses, I hardly get any direct mail from <laughs> any other marketers. So that's my clue that I don't have that much competition. As a result, and don't hold back on me, John, just because we're friends. I want you to tell me exactly what you think here as if I were a paying client, okay, for you to help me my conversions. Me and my team, so I have one acquisitionist, all right? So, I mean, we do two to three deals a month. You know, the average profits are $67,000. So I'm a, as far as number of deals, small number, but we got large profits per deal. So we really play, 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 play on the rapport and establishing relationship. And this is how we do this. The first conversation my acquisitionist has with them, you know, finds out what, you know, what's going on, gets the property lead sheet, et cetera. Next con and, and we make no offer. You know, we find out of course what they're, you know, what they're looking for and et cetera. And then the next thing that takes place is, you know, we do some research, et cetera. There's the second conversation with the acquisitions to them saying, you know, we're really interested in taking a look at your home. Let's set an appointment to come look. Second conversation. Third conversation is in, is in person. Acquisitionist, realtor, the whole team, the con, you know, the contractor. That third conversation is in person. Actually, that's the fourth conversation because the acquisitions had to set the appointment to come look. So fourth conversation is in person. Still an offer. Fifth conversation. So the fifth conversation would be an offer over over the over the, that takes place over the phone after we've left the property, and then negotiation continues. You know, I mean, you know, no telling how many conversations take place after that, or sometimes it's immediate. What's your immediate take on that process? Process. I think some of the best teams out there are using that exact process. May take place over a different number of connects, right? It, it may go in that same order, those building blocks you laid out all over one call, few calls, in-home visit, whatever it is. But I think that just from a timeline perspective, that is the exact way to go after it. Now, again, some people will shorten that to two touches or three touches or, or even one touch over the phone, but they, they follow that exact same process where they step through piece by piece like that. The only recommendation I would potentially make to increase conversion rates is if possible, I would move the, uh, it may not be, be feasible depending on what work has to go into actually putting the offer together. But if you can move the offer to that on-site appointment, uh, chances are conversion rates would increase. And the reason is, is because people are going to be, it's, it's fresh, they're emotional, they've just worked through it, they're ready for a solution, they're primed and ready to make a decision. So you could increase conversion rates by, by speeding that up and giving the offer at the property. Um, and the other thing you'll do is, you know, again, doesn't sound like it's an issue in your market, but in other markets with, with extremely high competition, there's going to be four other investors that are in there. And one might, you know, finish, complete the deal before your next step takes place. So highly competitive markets, I see investors, you know, merging those two steps of your process and making the offer while they're at the property. Yeah. As I was reviewing the process with you, I heard my brain talking to myself. If I had any, if I had a fear of another real estate investor coming before we're getting back with them, I'm making the offer right there in person. Yeah, for sure. John, wow. We're out of time, but I know that we've got a lot of our audience here that would love to connect with you. And you've got this thing called the 21 day challenge. How does that work? Yeah, so we, I try to do a lot of free sales training. So that's one of the avenues we do. We've got a YouTube channel and probably 100, 150 videos on our website. But we put together a couple of years ago, a series of 21 sales training videos for real estate investors, just real small five-minute videos with 
actionable, real, helpful content. Hey, if someone says this, this is what you can say. If you're in this situation, this is what you do. And over a period of 21 days, we just drip those out one a day so, so people can grab a quick tip, start to implement it, and then move on to the next day. And it's just a good way to just start increasing your conversion rate. So that can be found on our website as well as just tons of other videos and, and scripts and, and other helpful stuff. Okay. And your website is, let's go ahead and give out your website for those that want to connect with you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Midwest Rev. So uh, name of the company is Midwest Revenue Group. So it's Midwest R-E-V, as in Victor, MidwestRev.com. Excellent. And they can take you up on the uh, 21 days of uh, free training. And uh, so one more time. And so it'll be in the show notes, but that is www.midwest, M-I-D-W-E-S-T, Rev, R-E-V is in Victor.com. And John, it's been great to have you on the show. Uh, parting comments. Uh, no, I just enjoyed myself. Thanks for having me on. Hey, hopefully we'll do it again sometime. Oh yeah. I hope so. Cause while we were talking, I wrote down seven more questions that I didn't have time to get to. <laughs> John, thank <laughs> you so much. I uh, look forward to seeing you in the next few days. To all of our uh, viewers and listeners, thank you for joining in. I'm Jay Connor, the Private Money Authority, wishing you all the best. And here's to taking your real estate investing business to the next level. We'll see you on the next show. Bye for now.